partners. Uh, this lecture is streamed nationwide also on Facebook Live. Everybody, I would like to welcome you to this. And uh, Mr. Swana as well, welcome. Our, whole, our, our guest, those who are new here, please leave your contacts below so that we can be able to contact you and explain to you what SALJEC stands for. Uh, we also urge you to visit our website, www.saljek.org. At ZA to get more information about the club and official membership is available for you. Uh, at Saljak, we believe that the challenges of our country are so huge that they include both financial, but they are psychosocial and economic. Uh, our five founding pillars addresses the psychosocial economic challenges of, the, of South Africa. And the intention today with your presence, Mr. Swana, is to have you talk to us on the fourth pillar of leadership in creating economic opportunities among local communities and ensuring beneficiation from local wealth. I think you call it repeatable systematic prosperity in your book, The Road to African Wealth, uh, which will be broken down beautifully tonight, I mean today. Recently, within Saljek, as WhatsApp group talks, the dominating conversations has been the wealth creation. Although I knew from inception that these conversations will be coming up at some point due to the existence of this pillar, I must confess that I never thought the conversation would come up this quickly. What makes me even more exciting is that our FOS, which is Friends of Saljek, which are the ladies uh, or the women within the subject were incredibly inspired by Mrs. Nta's talk a fortnight ago as a result of that. They are also talking wealth creation. They have also created WhatsApp groups where they are planning strategically to create wealth and empower women and also empower the club and all its mandate. I would like you to know that your talks here as often as you come at the club with us are not just talk show. You and many other speakers are planting good seeds for us, for our nation. And to that, we are eternally grateful for leadership. In South Africa, we fail to create economic opportunities. We all, in, in communities that we all emanate from. Hence the corporate capitalist um, capitalizes on this lack of wisdom and establish various strategic building uh, their wealth within communities where we are. Our massive educational ex experience and international exposure is unable to stimulate us to create economic opportunities in our communities. And the first thing that we ever think of after leaving school is to find a job, uh, find a new house, pay the bills. Yes, that has been routine for most South Africans for decades. Saljak aims to break this systematic evil enslaving neocolonialist routine. We call it here at Saljek the end of an old era and the beginning of the new one. So I'll go on and on about Saljek. We also call on the professionals like yourself, and we are very excited that you often come here as a strategic partner to share your wisdom with us. We promise you that this is not in vain. We will continue to learn from this and build up and build leaders and build our communities. The conversations that are going on within Saljek itself on economic wealth are very exciting. And I'm sure the leadership, the lecture today is going to be So ladies and gentlemen who are here, welcome again. Uh, Mr. Swana is our strategic home uh, a partner. He needs no introduction at all. However, I'll just for those ones who are very new here, just give you in a nutshell as to who Mr. Swana is. Sandile has been in private business since 96. He presently runs Sable, a software engineering and management consulting training. He, com he completed his BCom degree at WIRTS in BIS and economics, a BCom honors in logistics from UNISA, an MBA at UP. He consults widely on risk management and good governance and has taught part-time on the subject of best, uh, business school uh, and VETS business uh, School of Governance in 2007. He also completed 
BTEC and BTEC Honors in Christian Leadership and Ethics in UNISA. He is a accredited preacher of the Methodist Church, Southern Africa. Sandile has two adult children and grandson. He's married to Bonnie and he is so by birth and lives in Mohali City. Mr. Sana, I give over to you, sir. Uh, the nation is awaiting your wisdom. You are live also on Facebook. Uh, thank you so much, bro. Um, I am thankful for this afternoon. We are just struggling to to get the the lecture notes on, but I will start at any rate. So the the matter that is on the table today is the matter of of creating wealth. Mm. Uh, you guys say that you want to create wealth from local resources, beneficiation of, of wealth resources. Now, uh, I had to sit down and ask myself, what is it? When people say they want to deal with wealth, what is it exactly that you have to deal with? Now, I came to a conclusion that there's probably about six things that we have not attended to and that we actually need to attend to. The first one, uh, by way of introduction, but the first one is our system of beliefs. For instance, there, there are many dangerous beliefs that keep African people generally in, in financial disadvantage. That belief that in this, uh, I've prepared some literature for this, uh, deals with this issue that some people end up saying, you know, we Africans are cursed by God. And, and they quote the Bible and they support Christian doctrines that are unbiblical in nature, that says from the days of Noah, Africans were cursed to be slaves to, to white people. Mm -hmm. I've argued with Christians about this. Um, and, and in fact, a lot of... Uh, scholarship has gone into this area. One of my greatest friends, Professor Ndindili, they even prepared the Jubilee Bible to, to deal with this issue. Uh, he, he had studied in the US and, and they dealt with this issue quite comprehensive. And I was fortunate enough when I was a student at UNISA studying theology and Christian leadership and Christian ethics, that we studied this issue of the role of Africans in the Bible. So that is one of the issues I'll touch on a little bit today. Uh, that's one of the issues, but I will not go into the depth of it. That needs another session all by itself. Yes. But then the main thrust of my presentation today is also to say, when you say this is wealth, I am rich, I am wealthy, what do you mean? How do we how do we know who's rich and who's not? Uh, and what is, what is the content of wealth? Then the last part, which is the third part, is made up of five parts, uh, which is capital. For you to deal with wealth, you must deal with capital. And I, and I, and I, and I have titled this book from which I'm teaching today, The African Capitalist. And today, I want to teach you and myself, of course, to be masters of capital. This capital is broken down into elements and co or, or components of it. You have social capital, you have intellectual capital, you have human capital, uh, you have uh, 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 finance capital and physical capital. All of these forms of capital have got research behind them. And I am saying that Capital is that thing which produces, that you use to produce other things. As an example, if you have a sewing machine, a sewing machine is a capital good to produce clothes. Clothes are the final product that a person can take and wear, but you can't wear a sewing machine. A person who doesn't control capital, the thing that produces other things, uh, is going to remain poor. So for you to, to, to get to wealth, you must master capital. You must know how to control uh, capital. So that is, uh, that is the, 
the, the, the, the central pieces of my presentation today. So let me then start with the presentation. You may not be able to see it on the screen for a moment until we connect it. Just share your screen from the computer so we can see it actually if we have to download the um, so I was not connected from here. So, um, so what we'll do, let me then start to, um, uh, just a moment, I, I am not connected properly here now. All right. Uh, just a moment. While, while Mr. Sona is still sorting out his screen and uh, sharing it, there's a message right at the bottom that uh, one of our uh, leaders has invited Professor Lumumba, who is a great scholar and believer in this topic, to join us all the way from Kenya. So we've got African diaspora. When he logs in, please kindly let him in to join us. So yes, leader, we will definitely do that. And thank you for that uh, invite that you have extended. Just a moment. Yeah, just a moment. Uh, let's see here. Uh, where is that? Five, two, three, six. Yeah, that I'm the technology. Uh, no, the thing is, this computer of mine has seen better days, I think. <laughs> now I was trying to, to uh, actually get another one. Uh, but we'll sort it out just now. Okay. I need to learn this when you call us the screen sound. So the host should let me in now. Let me see. Uh, the host should let me Okay. So, yeah, okay. So, I hope things are getting better. Let me try and share the screen. You've disabled me again. Can you enable me to share the screen? Hey, I'm doing that, but there's um there's two devices, so there's uh, quite a bit uh, feedback. Can you try now? Yeah. The other message says I has also invited Dr. Singala, as a chairperson of SADC Business Chambers, to join us, especially to talk about the topic of AFCFTA, which will be. Get away to can you see the the presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. So, as you can see, the the topics there's that a, are there. There's an eco leadership. Is, is there anything that is that we can do to get rid of the eco? Mm -hmm. The mass. Mm -hmm. Mute, mute my computer, please. Um, the one you've just enabled now. Okay, you did the wrong one. Okay, it's muted on two devices now. Hello, you can hear me now. You can hear me now. Yes, we can. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, it's much much better. Much better. Thank you. So, as in order to address these topics, we said you have a need for Africans to understand that there's no such a thing as a case. So any problems we have are not related to a case. And then 
The other one is to explain the wealth situations of Africans. And then to go to the types of capital that need, we need to have in order to operate effectively in the marketplace. So it's social capital, human capital, physical capital, intellectual capital, and finance capital. So I'm not, we will not have enough time to go over all of these topics. So I've chosen to deal with the introduction and then to go to the topic of wealth and then go to the topic of social capital. Now, as you can see there, the purpose of this book above all is to provide a well-informed inspiration for Africans and people of African descent to energize themselves to decisively walk the road of wealth creation, accumulation, and intergenerational wealth cultivation. Uh, as we all know, there's a lot of people who become rich, but how many of our people are able to sustain wealth from generation to generation? Uh, so that's why there must be wealth creation, wealth accumulation, and intergenerational wealth cultivation. Africa today is, is regarded as, uh, in, many, in many circles, as an economic basket case, and generally a place of hardship, lack of integrity, and lack of productivity. However, many African families have, for the past three to five generations, built systems of sustained prosperity. Even when you read the success stories of Aliko Dangote of Nigeria, the richest African in Africa, uh, Strive Masiwa. In fact, uh, Aliko Tangote is the richest African on earth. Strive Masiwa, uh, the Zimbabwean uh, 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 billionaire in telecommunications and ICT. Keza Mutaung, most of you know from Keza Chiefs. Richard Maponya, uh, James Mwangi of Kenya and family, the Kunene brothers, Mohammed Mo Ibrahim of Sudan, uh, the telecoms billionaire, and many others. Uh, you quickly discover that there are family values, faith, and ancestral aspiration, inspirations that helped along the way. Meaning that, for instance, when you look at people like Aliko Tangote, his grandfather was a great businessman. His uncles were businessmen. So when we talk about ancestral aspirations, it means in the family and among the people that he grew up with as a young boy in the 60s and 70s, he learned, he got inspiration about business. So many today uh, speak of the 21st century as being the, uh, the African century. And in fact, um, Africa has dominated the list of the fast, fastest growing economies lately. Now, uh, when we talk, so the point of this is that when we start to see people prospering, it means there are others who've come before them, before that particular individual and done a great job to the point that uh, the, 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 that person has a platform for prosperity. My own father told us frequently that his own great grandfather prayed for his descendants to be well-educated, owners of cars, etc. In simple language, my great grandfather saw profound changes in the technological and sociological, uh, sociopolitical base in the early 1900s and prayed that his descendants will be fit for the coming new economic order. This idea made sure my grandfather was a school principal, my father a managing director of a multi billion rent finance corporation, and our generation are all entrepreneurs and intellectuals in South Africa. That is transgenerational transmission of ideas of progress and productivity. That is heritage. At the same time, there is a growing number of African, African nations who are now consistent in pursuing a meaningful economic uh, progress like Rwanda, Botswana, Ethiopia, Mauritius, and so on. Thus, African people are slowly embracing the idea of re repeatable systematic prosperity. Prosperity is not something that you should ideally collide with along the way. It is something that you should arrive at systematically and be able to do repeatedly, re repeatedly 
in a systematic fashion. Um, there is a road that leads to prosperity, excellence, and wealth, and it must be navigated carefully and wisely. In this case, prosperity or wealth simply means you have enough of all the ethnic goods and provisions to live the quality of life you determine to be satisfactory. This quality of life is culturally determined. And as an example, you may find a top professional allocating time to buy local porridge and barbecued meat from a local chisanyama for his or her lunch in an environment that many would not consider five star. But that is exactly what the person prefers. But that person and their companions will be well pleased with their provisions. Many African elites wear local, locally tailored uh, uh, suits, attires, including, and attires, including the famous Nigerian Babarika men's dress. Again, that brings about great pleasure and pride. Quality of life is culturally determined. However, there are minimum nutritional and other scientifically determined human, uh, human development standards under the United Nations that should over time modify and enhance our cultural determinations. Generally, no one becomes wealthy before they master capital. Capital comes in many tangible and intangible forms. And every community needs to be able to understand its own capital. Even a system of empowering beliefs do, do become a capital. Your beliefs can become capital or they can become a liability. Many nations over time develop a culture of innovation and creativity. This culture is capital in itself. And language captures that culture. Also, language enables thinking, imagination, and uh, creativity. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, Martin Luther King Jr., Paul Kagame are some of the leaders that fired up the imagination of their people in the most desperate of times to greatness and progress. Now, people then imagine a new and a better life. So when you want people to imagine a new and a better life, it means you must have a language for that. So as Africans, we must now have a language that says, what is a better life? What is prosperity? What is wealth? What is our language about that? All things that are important and useful to a particular culture and all of our tools for making success in life on earth are included and indeed, and indeed uh, make up our culture. So everything that is useful to you as a person, if you are a Mutswana, everything that is useful to a Mutswana, there'll be Mutswana words for it. It will be captured in your language. If there's something useful to a wronger person, uh, that thing will be captured in the language. All things that are helpful are captured there. So your culture, the library of your culture is your language. That is your language. Language is the library of culture, everything a culture knows as a word, a description and probably a definition in their own language. In fact, language shapes your outlook and the way of thinking. Your language is your primary thinking tool. So if you don't have a language, you don't have the thinking tool. The first thing that you need is to be able to think and you need a language for that. Albert Einstein said this, uh, the power of language, about the, power, the mental development of, of the individual and his way of forming concepts to a high degree, um, depend to a high degree upon language. This makes us realize that what, to what extent the same language means the same mentality. In this sense, thinking and language are interlinked. So a German scientist thinks like a German scientist. A Zulu scientist thinks like a Zulu scientist. A Tswana scientist thinks like that. So there are idioms and metaphors and, and constructions in your culture that enables you to tackle problems. So your language must be developed. In this sense, every person or people need a language of innovation and productivity in order to progress. Language shapes thinking and it must be developed and expanded. Language in this sense is capital. It is used to produce new goods and services. Capital is anything that can be used to produce other goods and services that generally allow human beings to enjoy the good life. 
So language is something that you use to generate concepts, concepts that you can convert to products. So you need language. Um, some scholars have told us clearly that you, you cannot economically develop if you don't develop your language. The good life is defined, all of this we're doing it to, 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 to achieve the good life. The good life is defined well by the Aga Khan Foundation. It is both objectively measurable. As an example, you cannot have untreated TB or infant mortality and say you have a good life. But good life is certainly defined by people in their own context and culture, and therefore is also subjective. So quality of life is defined as follows. So what do you mean? You are living well. This is what it means. A person whose basic needs are met, who can act effectively and meaningfully in pursuit of his or her goals, and is satisfied with life. This means that according to our understanding of life, you have enough accommodation, food, safety, independence to make your own decisions and to pursue your own dreams. In our times, the good life means taking better care of the environment, eliminating wastefulness, increasing health and wellness, and also creating a much more meaningful social life. Again, capital takes the form of social, human, physical, intellectual, and finance capital. And a unique combination of these forms of capital a, a capital creates inventions, innovations, and wealth, not just finance capital. Most of us, when we talk about capital, we talk about finance capital, not realizing that capital actually has got dimensions and you must master all these dimensions in order to create things that will create wealth. Families and communities who progress are the ones who develop people, develop talent and skills, simply, Human development is in fact the key ingredient of development. The most important natural resource that must be beneficiated is, human, uh, is the human being. All progress in the good life stands or falls on how people are equipped to bring about the good life. Uh, when I was talking to another class about this, the nation of Israel, for instance, lives in a desert with no natural resources, but they are one of the most wealthy and most innovative nations. How do they do it? They don't have mines in the ground, mines, they can't dig anything. So the only mines they've created are the mines of their children. So all the wealth they have comes out of the mines so you develop the minds and skills and abilities of the children, and those children create wealth. They invent products. Many American companies, including Microsoft, the fancy products they come out, they catch, they produce, they get them from Israel. So you, you can have wealth simply by developing the minds of the people. So the natural resources themselves, are, are in terms of what is uh, the water, uh, the forests, the, the minerals underground will not help you if you have not developed human capital. So human capital is the main thing to develop. And human capital, uh, and I'm not going to teach about it today, but you need to develop also the spiritual. So a person can be very intelligent in mathematics, intelligent in so many ways, but a psychological mess, psychological and psychiatric mess and totally useless. So you need to, to be able to develop humans comprehensively. All cultures and civilizations have a system of beliefs that they live and prosper by. Africa also needs to crystallize once again its beliefs. This is a renaissance. It's a rebirth of African civilizations and prosperity. One of the most tricky matters is that Africans are generally spiritual people and prosperity is, is definitely linked to God's favor in their minds. And there are many religions uh, and in certain parts of Africa, many gods. These religions have in times past powered many great African civilizations, cultures and empires, such as the Ethiopian empire, the Songhe empire, Nubia, which is Sudan and uh, Lower Egypt, Great Zimbabwe, Ghana, 
uh, Egypt itself, and so on. So, so there, 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 are, there have been religions and philosophies and cultures that powered African civilizations in times gone by. So logic should say that, however, God is many times associated with pain, slavery, apartheid, colonization, and imperialism, among many other, and, uh, among many other difficulties and atrocities. And at the same time, an examination of the Jewish Bible, Tanakh, the Quran, and the Christian Bibles, as well as the origins of this faith, clearly shows that God is in favor of Africans and that all African peoples are God's people. So for the sake of this presentation, we're just using the Bible. Psalm 68, verse 31. Ambassadors will come out of Egypt. Sudan will stretch out its hands to God in prayer. Those are Africans. So Africans are not people who are rejected by God. And it continues in Matthew 2, 13 to 15. After they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. The angel said to him, get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, because Herod intends to search for the, for the child and kill him. And Joseph got up, took the child and his mother and left for Egypt that, that night. And he stayed there until Herod died. What the Lord had spoken through the prophet came true. I have called my son out of Egypt. Now, Christ was called out of Egypt. When Christ was threatened to, buy, to die, to, to be killed, he was sent to Egypt. And God called him out of, sent him to Egypt to go and hide from death. Afterwards, afterwards, uh, he called him out. God called him out of Egypt. When we talk of African Christianity, we must also remember that the Coptic Church, the Nubian Church, the Ethiopian Church, and also the North African Church broadly in Libya, in Mauritania, Tunisia, Algeria, and so on, were operating on the continent before the European Protestant churches came into the Afri onto the African continent. St. Mark's, St. Mark the disciple of Christ and write out the book of Mark, started the church in Egypt, Alexandria, around AD 60. That was long before 1652. And that became the Coptic church. And this Coptic church also evangelized Sudan and, and birthed, and birthed the, the, new, the, the Nubian church. Abraham, the father of, of, the, of the Jewish, Christian, and Islamic faith, and his descendants used Africa as a place of refuge. And Africa played no small role in the history and development of this faith. Moses, the leader of the Hebrews, was married to an Ethiopian or a Sudanese woman. Joseph, his, predece his predecessor, was married to an Egyptian woman. Africans have a right to all the blessings of God, and the blessings of God make you rich financially. The blessings of God are for all nations and all peoples. Proverbs 10.22, it, it is the Lord's blessing that makes a person rich and hard work adds nothing to it. Now, now, let me read this as well. Matthew 5, 45, 44 to 45. But I tell you this, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In this way, you show that you are children of your father in heaven. He makes his son rise on people, whether they are good or evil. He lets rain fall on them, whether they are they are just or unjust. Now, whether Africans are just or unjust, whether they are good or bad or evil, God allows rain and the goodness and the bounties of God to fall on them. So even if you were cursed, you'll still be blessed by God. So let's continue then. Now, uh, there are blessings aimed at Africans in the Holy Scriptures. Him, the so-called progenitor of Africans, was blessed directly by God. So according to the, the, the Bible, where Noah had sons, one of them was Ham. Ham is regarded as the father of Africans. Uh, but Ham was actually blessed by God, side by side with his brothers. Another crucial aspect of faith is that wealth is created basically from nothing but human creativity and hard work. So a desolate place and apparently poor environment is the best place to demonstrate creativity 
by bringing in new technologies, water purification and, and water distribution systems. Holiday resorts, schools, universities, and factories, all from nothing, like nations like Singapore, Israel, Rwanda, Japan, Ethiopia, have demonstrated this between 1960 and now. So, for instance, a, a place like Limpopo, Limpopo, Eastern Cape, Soweto, Alexander, the places where you think there's nothing, those are the places where uh, you can create something out of nothing. That is where you use your faith, you use your creativity, you use your entrepreneurial spirit. Every bridge that is missing in Africa, every dam that is missing in Africa is an opportunity. Anything that you see is missing in Africa is an opportunity for you to be like God, to be a creator. So anything that you see that exists, whether it's Sentin City, Sun City, Stain City, somebody was like God and produced it out of himself or herself to cause it to come into existence. So when things are not there, it means to you that that is an opportunity. And that's the mentality that we need. That is acting like God. And God is God, regardless of any Bible, book or theology, because he looks after all of his creatures well. I trained as a software engineer. In that, in that discipline, we are taught to create software systems that do not exist. Create from your own mind and the knowledge of your customers. That's where you create from. Musicians, Jerusalem, where did the song Jerusalem come from? It comes from inside the person and it produces outside. Musicians, painters, sculptors, architects, etc. they know this well. Anybody who does something great starts with creativity on the basis of nothing. Now, Africans need to understand the practical content of prosperity and what items to pursue in the economy. That is to say, Africans should go beyond the empowering uh, spiritual and philosophical beliefs and tackle the real world with that power. Let me make this clear. Nations prosper even they have, even if they have many religions. Singapore has four main religions, Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, and Christianity. I am a Christian and I believe that all progress is about cross-pollination, learning from people who have different viewpoints from ours. That applies to languages and cultures, give people a chance to think and flourish in their own languages and then learn from them as well. A lot of time has been wasted by pursuing things that cannot in the best of times improve the well standing of Africans as defined by Africans themselves. The Americans have tried over time to define the American dreams. The Chinese have gotten to where they are after they launched the vision in 1979. Chinese was poorer than South Africa in 1979. And in 1979, they made a decision to prosper. Look where they are today. Africans have also tabled their own vision, the Organization of African Unity's Lagos Plan of Action for Economic Development of Africa for the period 1980 to 2000. That was in the 70s when they wrote that. From 1980 to 2000, that time has come and gone. However, progress has been very slow, and most of the time, nothing was done about the vision. All of us need to clarify what any African vision means in tangible terms for ourselves, our families, and in terms of improving quality of life. Let us say wealth is also the stock of things, including infrastructure that can sustain a population, or even just a family into the future. I am not overlooking the fact that traditional African wealth is held collectively by a family, including the collective strength of an extended family and that the idea needs to be re-energized amongst uh, Africans, that idea. Many middle-class Africans pursue a lifestyle of excessive consumption and expenditure in an effort to appear prosperous due to lack of understanding of the nature and underpinnings of wealth. Africa as a whole has not yet made a name for itself as a saver. Chinese households for the longest time have been saving above 20% of their income. Those savings have powered Chinese development and wealth creation. Most of the Africans, when they say they are now making progress, even when young people start to, to work, 
they buy a car, a GTI, a, a small BMW, a small Mercedes, something that depreciates at least by 12% when you drive a new car off the, the shop floor, it depreciates immediately. And they buy these cars because a car, you can take it anywhere and show it off. If you've bought a property, let's say I were to buy a property like here in Krugersdorf or buy it in Umtata or somewhere. If now I'm in Sentin and my property is in Krugersdorf and I'm driving an Uno fire, people can't see that I'm rich because the property is not with me. So we buy things that uh, show everybody that we're making. We buy the most expensive phone, uh, even if this, we can't use all the functionality. So a lot of time and money is wasted in those things. And our money is not safe. So China developed without too much borrowing because they had a lot of their own money. Their own citizens were putting money in the banks and the banks had money to finance development. The thing to be pursued is the control of the five forms of capital. So when you say, I am now going for prosperity, I am going for wealth, what must you go for? Go for the goose, don't go for the golden eggs. That's the goose lays. You see the goose is laying golden eggs. Don't go for the, for the golden eggs. Go for the goose. The goose is capital. What is that capital? It's social capital. It is human capital, intellectual capital, physical capital, and finance capital. So for instance, I'm here today only because Bo develops social capital. He can phone me at any time if he wants me to come and speak here and help him in any way, social capital. So he can make things happen. It's a relationship, but he can turn it into a deliverable. He can turn it into a product that the audience can enjoy and, and, and the organization can use to develop. Um, since I'm not going to be able to address all these topics, social capital, human capital, some of you have got a, a sense of what it might be. Intellectual capital, there's a young man there who is busy suing Vodacom. And the CEO of Vodacom at the time, Alan Not Craig, claimed that he had a, 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 a dream of some sort, a revelation while standing on the balcony of how to do please call me and he designed it himself. And in court papers, it was shown that the, it was not Alan Not Craig who designed that thing. It was this young man, I forget his name now. Now that is intellectual capital. When you know, when you've designed something and developed something, it can even be a book that can earn royalties. Like the person who designed the Coke, the Coke formula, Coca-Cola formula, the formula ends X number of cents per, per liter of coke sold. Finish. That's intellectual capital. Physical capital. For me to do this presentation, I need a laptop. I need a quiet room. I need lighting. That is physical capital. For me to go to meetings, I need cars. More importantly, I need a place. I need land. I need enough facilities, physical facilities. If you don't have those things, you are not going to make it. And finance capital, you know, borrow money, there's all kinds of forms of finance capital. So you need all these types of capital and you need to know they exist and you must have them. And therefore develop strategy of how you are going to get each one of them. In simple terms, Africans need to control those things that produce wealth and also develop the expertise to use them. Any item that can be used to produce wealth is capital. That means becoming a capitalist is to become a master of capital, a self-starter who is self-reliant, but is also a major contributor to the upliftment of those around them. So capital, we must not see it in this sense that the unions see it. Capital are things, a sewing machine, your grandmother who's got a sewing machine making clothes for, the, for people and selling them. She has, must, she has got capital and that sewing machine is capital. And it, it's a capital and it's a capital code that produces other things. You are not going to produce, I write a lot, I need writing tools. So those writing tools, they are capital to me. So I need to be a capitalist in that sense uh, that the capital that I need to, to, to have and to use to get to the place of prosperity or productivity that I want to get to, I must have and I must know how to get it. 
It must be commonplace that the largest investors in African projects are Africans. The largest projects in Africa should be led by African engineers and funded largely by African financiers. Ethiopia has demonstrated that such an approach is feasible in its financing of the Grand Renaissance Dam. So Ethiopia wanted to build a dam for $4.8 billion. I think I worked it out, I think it was about something like, uh, I can't remember, was it 86 million rands or something? Billion rands. Now, they, the international funders did not want to, to invest in that project. So Ethiopia used, asked the citizens to put the money in, and they did. And that dam this year has finished the target of filling up the dam this year for the target for this year. They finished filling it up for this year. They built the project. Once they saw the, the, the US, the IMFs, the World Banks, and all these people, once they saw the Ethiopians are building the dam, regardless of who says what, with their own money, they started offering Ethiopia money to borrow. So, so then when you are now independent, people come to you on your own terms. The citizens directly invested their own money in building that dam, led and facilitated by the state. When we control our own capital, we can build proper friendships with outsiders that are based on mutual respect. We must get off the road that goes to poverty and onto the road to wealth and productivity. Africans will now proceed into the creation of large successful enterprises, sound families, technological invention, academic excellence, and so on. We must lift our families, friends, and communities as we rise into substantial wealth. When you finish reading this book, you will embrace wealth. The God of Abraham, spirituality, generally, and good relationships all at the same time with a clear conscience and focus. You must embrace spirituality generally. You must embrace good relationships and all of this with a clear conscience and focus. Africa is now accepted by leading universities of the world, including Cambridge and Wits, as the cradle of humankind. In fact, many leading scholars now say that all modern humans originated in Africa. This points to the important conclusion that modern human beings share the same ancestors and all human being, beings are blood brothers and sisters. Science and the Abrahamic faith nullify any thoughts of a pure race or a superior or inferior ethnic group. Africans are people of diverse physical features, and present the widest range of skin colors, textures of hair, and in fact, the most varied set of genes than any other continent, because everybody comes out of Africa. We must also understand that for thousands of years, Africans voluntarily traveled into Asia, Europe, and intermarried and interbred with those uh, continents. African armies invaded both Europe and Asia and vice versa the Carthaginians or Tunisians, if you like, who came out of Tunisia in North Africa, occupied Spain and Italy from 575 BC to 206. And later on, history records, records that the Moors uh, occupied Spain for 700, from seven, 711 AD to 1492, for about 700 years, the Moors were an assortment of Arabs and Africans. So black people occupied and colonized Europe uh, for 700 years. And what that does is that it creates a situation where, um, where the blood of Africans is all over the Mediterranean regions in Europe, the genetics. So those are our relatives in any event. Africans are, are those who live permanently in Africa 
without any further consideration of ethnic superiority or inferiority based on complexion. Beyond that, uh, we also have to recognize that there are descendants of Africans who left Africa involuntarily and whose African heritage cannot be denied or ignored, situated all around the world, including the Americas, Asia, and Europe. Those are the people who are taken out of Africa as slaves. Ethnicity and race considerations have already been proved to be a waste of time and a hindrance to human progress. In reality, all of humans belong to one race regardless of complexion and texture of hair. In this light, there is no, nothing genetic about wealth, success, or productivity. In other words, the white man does not become rich simply because he's white. There's nothing genetic about wealth. There's nothing based on complexion or the continent that you come from. Wealth is suitable and is capable of being achieved by anybody. However, soft issues like language, culture, beliefs, values, and religion do play a major role in determining the welfare and quality of life of any society because uh, these things govern thought and action. The greatest obstacle is when any group of people embrace self-limiting thoughts and practices. I listened to Miles Monroe, who eventually wrote at least 40 best-selling books in his lifetime from the Bahamas, saying that he was reluctant to write because he thought people of, of the world could not readily bring themselves to read a book written by a person of African descent. And Miles was a great intellectual, but because of many years of indoctrination from the days of slavery, Miles was born in the 1950s, but those doctrines were still there. And, and a bright, bright guy, educated in the US, he has still had self-doubt. As a South African, I grew up in an environment where the inherent human value of Africans was always under attack, and we still have to recover from those misleading doctrines. Now, wrong beliefs impede progress and must be replaced deliberately with empowering and liberating beliefs. Nelson Mandela had to inspire himself and all of us from time to time. This is what he said. There is no passion to be found playing small in settling for life that is less than the one you are capable of living. So this chapter one, I'm not going to, uh, to engage in. This is a comprehensive explanation of our relationship with God and those people who have been making false accusations against us and making Africans to believe that they are cursed of God. So I've put a long theological treatise here that uh, I think will be very helpful to those who will read the book. I will not teach that today. I want to go to the issue of wealth itself now. Leadership, there's a sidebar that's got a number of documents on your left. It's on my left, I don't know from you. Can you close it so that the screen becomes bigger? Yes. Okay, let me do that, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, here we are. Uh, understanding the current wealth and capital of Africans. Sometimes we hear stories, Utus Banbanu rich, but what is a rich person? When you say you want to be rich, what do you want to do? So, for instance, you want to be educated, you want to be a PhD, you want to be a metric, you want to be a big a B degree, M degree, B honors, or what is it, what level? So when we talk about wealth, I think we need to introduce this concept of what is wealth, what, how do you measure it in economic terms? The African peoples find themselves in a position where they do not have well-established numbers and members in the upper economic class of Africa. No, do they make up a stable middle class economically? The upper economic class is always populated by the owners of large successful businesses. In fact, the upper economic class can rightly be called the business class or entrepreneurial class. Simply, to be wealthy, you must certainly control and own productive assets. If you don't own productive assets and control them, you are not going to be one of the rich people. 
The largest number of Africans are located within, within the unstable lower echelons of the middle class and in even greater numbers amongst the unemployed, the peasants, the informal business owners and blue collar workers. At best, about 1 billion Africans are poor and only a quarter of Africans have some form of financial dignity. Say about 300, I'm talking about the entire continent now, I'm not talking about people of South Africa. Say about 350 million Africans form the middle class and the upper class. Now let's look at it and I subscribe to the definition of the African development. The task of defining the African middle class has always been difficult due to the lack of availability of and access to existing quality data. Previous estimates of the African middle class often use different criteria and vary widely. To cite a couple of examples, according to the African Development Bank, it consists of 350 million people earning between $2 and $20 per day. Now, if you earn $2 per day, it means you are making 36 rands per day. If you are earning $20, it means you are making 360. Uh, I think if I calculated correctly, it means your monthly income is 10,800 rands. Now, the it means the upper limit, the person who earns the most in the middle class by, by this definition is a person who earns 10,800 rands a month. That's what they call a middle class in Africa. If you are making, if you are in the top echelon, you'd be making 10,800. In comparison, a homing caras from the Brookings Institute puts the number at 32 million people earning between 10 and 100 person per day, $10 and $100 per day. But now if you, if you increase the limits here, the amounts, the number declines substantially. It's only 32 million people in Africa who earn between that. 10 US dollars is 180 rands per day, 100 uh, dollars per day, that's 1,800 rands per day, you know, uh, meaning that, uh, what is that, where does that take you to? If you say 18, 18, 36, uh, let's say 50,000 at the most per month. Now, the African middle class uh, largely work for the state. This is another important aspect. Multilateral organizations like the United Nations, African Union, SADC, and all those things. Multinational corporations, indigenous formal businesses, and really have no personal control over making significant lawful incomes. Many in the stable middle class in Africa are pursuing various professions as lawyers, doctors, IT professionals with decent incomes, others run informal businesses generally. These middle class people have to work to generate income. So they earn through their own labor. The upper classes generally earn from land. In other words, they rent out property, whether it's a commercial building, whether it's a block of flats, they own or land even farms. They own those things. Those are the upper class. He's sitting at home, he gets rent every month. Finance capital, they've got capital. People want to start businesses, borrow money from them. They earn interest. They earn shares and they have shares and for those shares they get profits and dividends. And then they also work and get labor. So they've got four sources of income. That is the upper class. Now, you who are listening to me here, it means that you must have control of these things. In other words, land, that's physical capital, whether it is buildings or whatever, so that you are able to generate rental income. All the beautiful buildings you see in Gauteng here, most of the time, black people have got nothing to do with those buildings. They don't even know something they are owned by government, but these are buildings that are owned by private people who are earning rent from companies that are renting those buildings. Finance capital. Africans have been trying to start banks, the African Bank, VPS Bank, MIG Bank, who have not succeeded until now. So we don't control finance capital altogether here in South Africa. Shares and profits, I will talk again later. 
at best we probably own about two percent of what is on the JSE in terms of the companies listed there. Then labor, labor is our thing. Even those that we respect a lot, they work in companies they do not own. They get a salary. That's why you find people like uh, what was his name? Peter Moyo being fired at the old mutual. It's not his company. That's why they, they could fire him. The middle and lower uh, 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 income groups cannot rely on incomes from rental properties, company profit shares, or interest on their cash savings simply because they do not own such productive assets. Africans are poor in terms of both income, asset, income and assets. Now, let, let me repeat that. Africans are poor in terms of both income and assets. Now, if you wanted to know if you are rich, even if your income for labor that you do is small, let's say I'm, I'm making a hundred times a day as a gardener, but I have properties that give me three million rands a month for rent. I have profit shares I'm getting another three million rands a month from those, from those uh, companies. And I've got interest, I earn interest another three million, meaning that nine million rands worth of profit is, is coming to me from sources before I even do any work. So if you want to know if you are rich, how much of your income is actually coming from assets rather than coming from labor? Asset poverty determines inequality and financial stability. So sometimes people can give you a very high salary, like many of our middle class and most of the celebrated black people have got high salaries, but they don't control capital in South Africa. And the groups, the members of this group are here to start that now you must start owning capital. Unlike in Germany, USA and other successful nations, um, formal successful businesses are not yet the backbone of the African economy. Income generating assets determine financial stability and overall economic resilience. This means Africans cannot make independent decisions personally or nationally. They are servants to their lenders and donors, generally speaking. When I was a student, now, whether you like this, whether it is true or false, just listen to it. When I was a student in 1996, doing my master's at the University of uh, Pretoria Business School, at the business school, doing an MBA there. The comrades started a thing called the RTP. And one of the professors, Africans professors, they liked me a lot, used to tell me what was going on. The African, the white business establishment confronted Mandela that they no longer want this thing. They wanted the policy change, the economic policy. And they said to him, every other 48 hours, we're going to remove X amount of money out of South Africa if you do not remove this policy. That is how you got here. So if you are running your own country and your own natives do not control the actual capital of the country, then you have a problem of being threatened and being controlled what programs you're gonna run in the country. So even political power becomes meaningless, which is the truthful case in South Africa right now. Ethiopia challenged the stereotype by funding the construction of the Grand Renaissance Bank from domestic savings. So when Ethiopia recently challenged this, it was 11 years ago, they've been at it for 11 years, and said, we're going to fund this thing ourselves with our own money. Every citizen is going to have a share. They are standing with international funders, changed. Let me add to this point that in Japan, as you look at me now, the last time I borrowed money from the banks for business was in 1996. I've never borrowed money again. If I do a business, I try and do it with my own capital. Anything I do, I do it with my own money. This set of circumstances presents widespread poverty and its resultant de dehumanizing effects. Poverty is dehumanizing in that a person of limited financial means will in most cases be unable to defend his or her rights and dignity. A poor person cannot even have a good warm bath in private 
nor sleep in complete privacy. They may often eat in an unclean environment and eat low quality food at that. All over Africa, there is a growing problem of poor nutrition causing obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and many related diseases that need to change, that needs to change to where we produce a rich, uh, 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 organic, nutrient-rich organic food and keep our health. Now, uh, let me then skip some of these things. There's something that now I want to get to the numbers is it is right to be rich. Africans must embrace the idea that they must become US dollar millionaires and billionaires and aggressively pursue that objective in large numbers. I use the US dollar here as a standard for measuring wealth because a person can be a billionaire in most African currencies and remain a financial non-entity. If you are a billionaire in South African rents or Zimbabwean dollars today, yet you are nobody uh, in US dollars. If you have a million South African rents, it makes about 66, uh, 66,000 US dollars, a million. A million, you are a millionaire in South Africa. In the US, when you get there, you left 66,000 rent. Indeed, around 1979, it was one rent to one dollar, but that is not so today. Poverty and a better lifestyle are to be hated with the same passion that we hate oppression, disease, and ignorance. Poverty is neither compulsory nor necessary. It is not a noble objective. It is generally degraded. The United Nations is using its powers and its best abilities to abolish poverty on earth because poverty is undesirable. Wealth is a very good, is very good and enhances quality of life and human dignity and must be treated as such. Simply put, savings must be enough to carry you without income or salary for five years. So if your monthly expenses are 20,000 per month, your savings must be 60 times 20, which is 1.2 million. This means that you have five years to figure out a financial or business solution to your problems. Most of you have never been told this. So when COVID came, you had savings for two weeks. So after two weeks, we are bankrupt, we are running from Mashonisa to Mashonisa. That is the end level of wealth. A good financial safety margin. Baba. <laughs> uh, poverty means your savings do not exceed three months. So if you are poor, if your monthly expenses are, 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 are 20,000, then you left 60,000 per month, for, 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 which can keep you for three months. You are still poor if you are like that. Simply put, you are financially unstable. We must all agree that poverty confers no advantages to anybody. So what is the extent of truly wealthy people in Africa? In Africa, there are only 23 US billionaires in Africa for a start. There are one, 1.3 billion. Can you see that number there? Mm -hmm. 1 billion, 347, 333, and 4 uh, million. 1 billion, 347 uh, million. That's 1.3 billion. Out of that whole number, it's only 23. 23 US billionaires. 23. High net worth individuals own 42% of Africa's total wealth. Africa accounts for 16% of the world population, but 1% of the world's wealth. Can you see that? We make 16% of the population of the world, but we make 1% of the world's wealth. To make matters work worse, of the 2.2 trillion in total wealth held in Africa, 42% belongs to 140,000 people who are considered to be the high net worth people. That's 140,000 people out of 1.3 billion, controlling $920 billion of African wealth. These people 
who control that amount of money in Africa. Uh, they are just, uh, they can just overflow perhaps the, the, the largest stadium here in South Africa, which is FNP with 100,000 people, 140,000. The number uh, includes the 23 billionaires living in Africa, each with net assets of 1 billion or more. A high net worth individual is anyone who has financial assets worth more than 1 million US dollars, meaning 18 million rands liquid to invest, excluding your primary residence, cars, and personal effects. So if you have 18 million rands in cash for investment purposes free, and you don't count your house when you count your assets to be, uh, to be considered wealthy. You assume you've got your house, you've got your cars, you've got your clothes, you've got your, your furniture. We don't count that when we count wealth. To put those numbers into perspective, the average person living in Africa has a net assets of 1.9 thousand, uh, 1.9, 1,900 US dollars, compared on average in the world is 27,000. Can you see, this is how much the average African owns in assets. This is how much the average human being on earth actually owns. So we are poor, totally poor. Now, um, a poor person is in great danger of being a materialist and their stomach becoming their God. In reality, they suffer from the same fate as their other greedy materialists because of their longings and desires with no spiritual well wellness. Wealth must be acquired in broad daylight using wisdom, sound ethics, and lawful means, as the likes of Strais Masiwa, Mo Ibrahim, and Aliko Dangote teachers. You do not have to be crooked or wicked to be wealthy. Just as much as you do not have to use unlawful drugs to be a top performing athlete or a top student. You can win clean, therefore do not assume that rich people are dirty. Let's continue then. What does it mean to be rich? I'll skip that one. The leading African in the world states is Aliko Dangote at number 162 in the world. So when the list of people are listed to are wealth in the world. The richest African on earth, including Americans, is at number 162. Mm. And he has got $7.2 billion. That's how rich Aliko Tangote is. Now, compared to the number one Amer richest person on earth, Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos is the world's wealthiest person for the third year in a row, despite giving away to his wife $36 billion worth of his Amazon stock to his ex-wife for their divorce settlement. Bezos gave away 36 billion for divorcing his wife. Aliko, his total assets are 7.2. <laughs> After Bezos gave away 36 billion, he remained the richest man on earth. That's where Africans stand. We will not go into further details about this. <laughs> and Aliko, would have to increase his wealth 15 times to catch up with Bezos. That Bezos is the owner of Amazon. He would have to achieve a 1,500% increase. Let's continue that. I want to rush so that my time is good. Posha raised the hand. Posha has raised the hand. Oh, who's Poshia? Maybe she was just oh, okay. gesturing on what you just said. Yeah. Another thing that you need to know is that when you become properly wealthy, your wealth is not managed at Capitec. <laughs> you, you, your wealth is managed at a thing that is called the private bank. So those are some of the things you've got to understand. Private banking consists of personal, personalized financial services and products offered to high net worth individuals um, of retail banks. Let's just keep it there. And they will tell you that the minimum assets that you must have uh, is a certain number. I, I think sometimes it's like they say at least you must have 3 million rand or something like that. 
But the bottom line is that you need to, to know this. Now, private banking consists of personalized financial and investment services. Private banking is an offering for the high net worth individual clients of financial institutions, a high net worth individuals own by international standards this time. 18 million rands liquid cash for investment, excluding his or her residence, personal effects, and private cash. Private banking clients typically receive discounts and preferential pricing on, on, on financial products. So when you become rich, you almost pay zero interest. We'll discuss that on another day. Now let's look at it so that you guys need to know how to set targets for yourselves. Mm -hmm. How far you must go with this thing. A uh, high net worth, where a household has at least 18 million rents, US dollars, 1 million, in net financial, ex uh, excluding the primary home and personal effects. Very high net worth, you owe 90 million at the current exchange rate, or US dollar, 5 million. Ultra high net worth, it means you have 540 million rents, or US dollar, 30 million. Those are categories that you need to know on a serious note. Now this one, I'm not going to emphasize it too much other than to say to you, you must just pay attention to that part, that Black South African include, including colors uh, and the so-called Indians, who actually are South Africans. Many analysts believe that true ownership of the JSE is less than 77% due to the high levels of debt uh, who borrow money trying to buy a listed company. Then now, let's continue. What are we looking for? What are we looking for? The traceable cause of all wealth in any family's entrepreneurship coupled with advanced skills that come from tertiary education or formal training in a trade or profession. The second best option for making money is to become a senior executive in a very large corporation and qualify for a lot of shares in that company. According to a survey, by best wallet heads, the top 10% of US income earners are gaining wealth from businesses, farm and or self-employment income. Half of their income comes from wages through business and other half comes from interest, dividends and capital gains. Those numbers have been changed since 1989. Millionaires suggest that several paths to building your wealth and becoming a, and, and becoming a millionaire. One path to consider is having multiple streams of income. I've told you those multiple streams. You can have properties, including industrial and commercial properties that you rent out um, and residential properties. You can have shares in different businesses. Um, you, you can have financial investments that you make, a, a, a fixed deposits, a financial buying, uh, this and that and the other one. No, um, let's not talk about these ones you get on Facebook. Um, those who want to earn more money should make sure that all of their income streams are growing. So once you've got different income streams, you must make them grow. Entrepreneurship is the ability to creatively organize all relevant resources into a sustainable enterprise that adds significant value to human society. An entrepreneurial enterprise must improve the lives of its customers over a long period of time, and it must affect a lot of people. A little corner shop that never grows to a sizable and formal business does not constitute entrepreneurship. That is Zamazama. A business whose total sales cannot be measured in millions of US dollars is not entrepreneurial. In fact, a very large number of Africans must get into the habit of creating and running businesses 
that 10 hundreds of millions of US dollars a year and also multi-billion US dollar businesses. Entrepreneurship is rooted in creativity, the ability to make and manage risk and bear direct responsibility for success of an enterprise. Entrepreneurs are marked by perseverance in the face of challenges that make an ordinary person uh, totally sleepless and scared. They can calculate ways of walking in dangerous paths successfully, but their main instrument is faith, coupled to hope and confidence that they can take a calculated risk and win. There are, of course, times when courage is the only instrument left for an entrepreneur. Great South African entrepreneur Raymond Eckerman says entrepreneurship is 90% cuts, 10% capital. Once you have visible and tangible dreams that you are pursuing fully, investors will follow you, even if after much struggle. Okay. Now, uh, let me then start uh, uh, winding this down. What I want you to be aware of, which is what is written here, is that because money is going to be made in new businesses, old families that have been rich before are not the ones who are going to be necessarily making the most money. It is those of us who are entering the markets for the first time. One of the biggest uh, business opportunities in Africa is um, agriculture, high-tech agriculture. And, and, and the African Development Bank is going to be investing a lot of money. And they say that's the area, all aspects of agriculture, that's going to be producing the next round of millionaires. But I want to say to you, everything that is lacking in Africa uh, is actually a business opportunity for you. Now, the next chapter, which I'm closing with, I've got eight minutes to talk about. Let me skip all of this and go there. Just to show you that it is there, you get the book and read it. Uh, I have explained some. Now, now, guys, let me just make this point. I've said to you, my aim is to teach you to be masters of capital. The objective then is to be capitalists, professionals in the game of using capital profitably for ourselves, our families and community, communities. A professional is distinct and distinguishable from an amateur by displaying advanced formal skills that are practiced with self-evident excellence and, as well as predictable results and rewards. You become a professional by accumulating large volumes of pertinent knowledge skills and techniques. Simply professionalism is about mastery. So we are, I hope now we are going to start becoming capitalists, you guys. And you become a professional. You handle capital the same way that Messi handles a football. And we are not going to be like that if we are casual. You need to be deep. You need to be very, very deep. Now, let me make a last commentary on these five forms of capital. And then I'll open for questions. Social capital. Social capital means that you build networks. If you want to go into farming, you must know who knows about veterinary medicine, who knows about plants, who knows about animals, who knows about financing agriculture. You build a network of people that you can call upon. And the way you build a network, you don't build a network simply uh, opportunistically only. Many, like for instance now, I'm doing community work here. I am not asking anybody to pay me anything for this. But I believe in this cause that you, you guys stand for. So I will invest. I mean, I woke up probably at about five this morning and I was reading the whole day, getting ready to present. Right? And I'm not going to get paid for that. But I want to do my best. And you guys must know that I'm doing my best and you must see that I'm doing my best. That builds a relationship. Later on, you say, Sandile is a man I can trust. Sandile 
is dedicated. So when now we need to do business together, we've been working together, then we can do business together because we've been through a few things together. That's how you build social capital. And it's something that you do every day. You build social capital with people who are valuable and people in whose life you can also plant the seed. You can make a contribution. You can contribute to their success. So that when you need them one day, they can there. So social capital in the native tongue, you can say is Anja Ziakeza. Finance capital, all of you understand that, but it can be sophisticated as well. Human capital, the biggest problem that we see here is that there's a lot of Zamazamas in many professions in South Africa. People have got superficial knowledge about the very thing that they want to make money out of. My son studied finance. He, 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 uses his, he used his financial skills to build a business in dentistry, to buy up dentistry business. So he had to learn a lot about dentistry and buy and get a team around him and buy these businesses. He went into IT now to try and buy IT business. And the owners of IT businesses could not take him seriously because they saw that this, this man doesn't know anything about this thing he's talking about. And I said to him, you see, the problem with you is that people cannot sense depth in you. You have no depth. You are a lightweight. So you need to go back and build muscle. But in the meantime, I'll use my muscle to push you forward. But you don't have muscle. Physical capital. Physical capital, I told you, these laptops, these cell phones, land, buildings, you cannot do a job without the tools for the job. Intellectual capital, Africans pay no attention to intellectual capital. For instance, Brenda Fass's family, how much money are they making out of her songs? All the people were writing all sorts of books, all sorts of things they've invented, have they painted at them? That's intellectual capital. So I'll stop there and then let's open it for, for questions. But you will see that as you go down the book, all these things are there. And I'm saying you cannot beneficiate anything if you don't train your people to be masters of capital, and that is what capital is. So, Bo, let me stop there. Wow, leadership, this was very powerful. Absolutely powerful. I went through it myself, but now that you're explaining it and taking us through it, it's even, yeah, I, I'm getting it. It's even much more powerful than I, I, I got out of it, and I'm very grateful. And to those subject members, I have shared this, this document or this book with you on all the WhatsApp groups, both Friends of Saljak and the main group of the, the chants themselves. Very powerful. I've taken so much from this. And I see a lot of comments already here at the bottom. I'm sure people have taken notes. And yeah, I've seen a lot of comments. People have questions and they would like to just go for it. While you guys are preparing your questions, I can just read a few that I see here. Building social capital, be reliable, be committed, deliver as per promise, let your word be good enough. Work ethic. What's this, Makosa Zana says? Uh, very splendid presentation, my leader, Mr. Swan. Uh, Usis Poshia says, put your money where your mouth is. Incredible. A lot of comments that I get here. Uh, can I get questions? Mr. Msama, because I'm not a host, I'm not able to see if there's any hand up. Can, Can you guys I have... ask a question? Sorry. Oh, yes, 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 yes. go for it. Yes, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Hi, sorry. sorry, sorry. Yes, um, I'm trying to put my hand. I don't see on my computer where is the part for the head, but in any case, it's fine. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Swan. That was a powerful presentation. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, a quick question. Uh, against the backdrop that you find ourselves in, where we are in heavy debt, as a, as a, obviously as a country, we all know, uh, with the IMF debt, the Chinese debt, etc. My concern is that um, for anybody who wants to dive into entrepreneurship now, especially if you don't have previous capital that you have accumulated, uh, obviously you go, at some stage, I think the whole tax burden is going to catch up with us to pay back uh, our creditors that we owe as a country. So in a way, you actually end up starting on a, you work very hard as a, as a, small, um, as a, a small business owner 
or entrepreneurship in whatever sector you are in. And then, um, in a way, that money finds itself to going back to SARS to pay back uh, not just your own uh, individual um, um, uh, tax as a, as, a, as a business, but also, obviously you find ourselves being um, in this trap of this dead trap that you are in because of all these loans we are taking because of our, our unfortunately, our economy having been mismanaged so much. Sorry to say that, but that's just strongly how strongly I feel about it. So against that backdrop, my concern is um, as, a starting, as a starting up entrepreneur one, uh, there isn't sufficient uh, capital available, right? Financial capital available right now to assist because obviously there, you know, there are lots of competing priorities that the country has to, um, you know, has to balance, find a way to balance the little bit of money that we actually have. Uh, that's one. So there is probably going to be a shortage of capital, and we don't all have, um, you know, easily accessible cash to start start up our own businesses. So that's one. And then number two, the fact that when you do eventually start. Uh, whichever much money you have are uh, able to access and start, you then find yourself trapped in the in the in the tax situation. I know right now I think it's about is it forty percent? Uh, uh, I can't remember the last figure. I think it's about there. I think in the future it's probably going to increase because how else are they going to um, generate um, income tax except for taking some money from business, etc. Anyway, that's another debate for another day. So you find yourself that already you are there's those two devils you are faced. So to use that word, you are faced up with one. The individual tax you're going to pay too. There isn't enough money circulating around for you to do it, to support us as emerging entrepreneurs to actually start up businesses and um, you know whatever venture they may be. So how do we navigate ourselves amongst the current environment that we're in right now? We do want to you know work hard, put in the time, uh, you know build clientele, get the revenue in, and and prosper. But right now, um, you know in the situation that we're in right now, I don't want to appear negative, but I'm trying to be realistic and practical. How do we navigate ourselves? Because that's a reality that we all face as emerging entrepreneurs and as SMMEs, especially because there are very few of us are, set, uh, are capitalists at the moment. We all, we all aspire to get there in the in the future, but currently we are not. Most blacks are actually SMMEs. We're still stuck in that level. Um, so how do we? How do you? I know it's a difficult question, Ms. Swana, and probably it's unfair of me to ask that question to yourself because you're not government. But uh, yeah, how well best can you advise us? Was this something that is real? It faces us every day. Um, it faces um, whether you're in the township economy or wherever you are, rural economy, etc. That's the situation that we face. And how do we, how do we as entrepreneurs? Yeah. Let, let, let me answer. Let me answer the question. Thank you. Um, the, the question has got two parts. Let me answer the part first that deals with the members of this organization where we are. Mm. Part of what I have not presented today is that when you, you go back into our history, there was an organization, some of you will remember, not so long ago, called Folkskas, Folkskas a bank called Folkskas. Absa is amal amalgamated banks. So there was Trust Bank, there was Folkskas, and so on. But I want to focus on the idea of Folkskas. What the African has realized, because the African those problems was that they didn't have capital to lift themselves out of poverty. They were very poor. Uh, in many cases, poorer than the Africans and less educated than the Africans. So they then said, once they were able somehow to gain power in, in 1948, let us form, form our own financial institutions, the United Banks, all those things that are going to fund Africans' businesses and white businesses generally which is what we have not done. I touched on it a little bit. So a lot of us here are actually members of stock firms, but these stock firms are not designed to finance businesses. If you are to calculate how much money is in stock firms, uh, you would be amazed uh, that it runs into billions. And we're not able to then use expertise, financial expertise to say, can we take this money and use it to finance black businesses? That is one of the things that I am trying to propagate and promote everywhere. Then on the part of government, there's a mistake that is continuing to be made. Uh, and they are trying to correct it in their own slow way. Because when the Reserve Bank releases money like they did this last time, that money goes straight into NetBank, 
Standard Bank and so on. And those people have a long track record in the, since 1994 of not funding SMMEs, not funding black businesses, not funding startups. Okay. So that money should have been channeled into uh, the state bank, whether it's the post office bank, which then employs people who are experts at funding SMMEs. Go into ECDC, Northwest Development Corporation, but you need now people who are competent to do the job. The last thing I want to say about the state itself and the taxes that you are talking about. The, the increase in borrowings uh, by government is not our biggest problem. Our biggest problem is that our income, which is GDP, has been declining over time. It has not been growing fast enough. So for instance, to, um, to, if I go and I borrow money that my installments are 100,000 rands a month, somebody could say Sana is over borrowed, but if my income is 3 million rands a month, I pay that 100,000 without bl blinking. So the problem in South Africa is not the extent of borrowing. The problem is that since 2009, no one, not Pravin Kordan, not Tito Mboweni, not Gigaba, no one has been able to come up with a credible program of increasing income. You can actually borrow the total debt to be more than your GDP. Japan does that successfully. So the issue of that we're borrowing too much is only to say we're borrowing too much because we're not productive. That's the only problem. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Swan, a brilliant answer. You're welcome. Are there more questions? Let's get more questions. Um, it's Portia here. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for today. Hey, yeah, I'm blown away. I'm, I'm still trying to digest in Davaye five years uh, worth of um, money that one must have to survive on. I'm thinking <laughs> we've been told of three months, have three months. The best I've had so far was, was Suz Omar says uh, between eight and eight months and a year to try and figure out. And, you know, today when you said five years, I thought to myself, wow, we're really just playing games, eh? If we are still thinking and struggling to just put together three months of savings. But um, it does make sense. It really does make sense that uh, we can't be in the first month of, of, of coronavirus hitting us we, we are scrambling and trying to find ourselves and having to sell houses and, and, and it's, I mean, there's a lot happening. So yeah, for me, I'm like, wow, okay. So I don't really have a question. I'm still trying to digest that part. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, ma'am. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, yeah. Whilst they are bringing another question, let me just say to Sis Portia that as a young man, when they were building Microsoft, Bill Gates used to insist that in the bank, in hard cash, they keep three years salary in the bank so that employees know every day that there will be no month when they don't get paid. Three months, three years worth of salaries in the bank. Wow. Wow. We, we actually really need cultural change, huge, huge cultural change. It's, yeah, it's, it's a long way to go. Mr. Swana, if I may ask a question myself, uh, when you look at the situation in our country, is it, is, it, is it a lost hope or is there hope when you look at it generally in our country? Is there hope or we have I, just... I, I, I think that there is, there is a lot of hope for all of Africa, including South Africa. The, you know, the, the three names that I've been using most, uh, Aliko Tangote. Aliko Tangote started going into business around 1979 in Nigeria as a young man. Nigeria was having coup after coup. I've been to Nigeria 
and I took my family for a holiday in Nigeria, I think three years back or something. They don't want to ever go back. I was trying to Africanize them and they, they said, this is exactly what we don't want. So you are talking about a country that is chaotic, but it has produced the richest men in Africa, running businesses there. South Africa is nowhere near the chaos that is happening in Nigeria. Secondly, Strive Masiwa is a Zimbabwe. Uh, Strive, these are young men who were born in the 60s, you know, the 1960s, early 60s. Uh, and is one of the major, major African billionaires. So coming from a chaotic country like Zimbabwe. So now, I think that when you come out of South Africa, some of us, when we started thinking of businesses and starting in business, I mean, I started only in 1996, but the comrades had not yet settled in the country. They didn't know what the hell was going on. So the people who had to ask for loans from were the actual Africaners, uh, 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 true and true. So, and, and I was getting some of my relatives into business. So to me, we need to have a mentality that says all of this presents stupendous opportunities for us to use whatever money, whatever resources and networks that we have to start businesses and build organizations, including NGOs like this one. So to me, uh, I am not even worried. Uh, everywhere I go, I tell people in the small towns, in the villages, start what you can. If you've got 5,000 rand, start a chicken business. If you've got 10,000, start something, get going. Powerful, get going. And guys, remember, uh, I think I took away uh, what I like the most. It's, Every problem that Africa has, it's a, it's, it needs a solution. And it's an opportunity for us to do something about it. So we can't say we lack opportunities. Let's look around, there's so much problems around us. And I normally emphasize that as well, that these problems need solution. And who else is better positioned to solve those problems? Ourselves, I think, and I believe. So any, any hand, any question, guys? Any comment? I get a comment here that says, it's Mr. Lepaku who says, I don't have a question, but I'm overwhelmed by the information. I'm grateful for this session. I have and a question. I, yes, sir. Yes, please. My name is Kwame. Uh, I'm calling in from Ghana. Uh, Nkosa Zana is the one who invited me. Thank you, Nkosa Zana. You are welcome. Uh, yes, I, uh, I've not been on all the way through. I've had uh, some network issues here. Uh, but uh, what, I, what I wanted to, to ask, maybe I didn't hear how... Uh, uh, he had dressed it well, uh, Mr. Sendile, uh, the issue of finance, because if you look at finance, like, for example, uh, really what is happening in South Africa is not really very different with uh, what is happening uh, in other parts of Africa. The only difference which is there, I think it could be maybe the land that in other parts of Africa, the Africans have access to land. But when it comes to finance, is, is not really different because the, the local uh, banks or microfinance institutions have been, uh, most of them collapsed. Like if you look at Ghana recently, th this year alone, they closed about, uh, about 40 local microfinances and banks. So you see that that is the problem. So I don't know how he addressed that issue of finance. And the ah. other thing is that if you look at the United States, for example, now they have about about 600 billionaires against a, a population of of six, or 350 million. Uh, when you look at Africa, like how he said, we have uh, 1.3 billion people and 23 billion billionaires. So how does he think that we are going to close this gap? Looking at that, like if you look at the, all the all the black people around the world. Uh, Brazil, the United States, uh, if you couple all of us, maybe we are around 1.7 billion people, but we own less than 1% of the total global economy. How long is this going to take for us to, to catch up if we don't control the finances? And even in some cases, like in South Africa, we don't control the land over there. Now, the other parts of Africa, we don't control the resources. So how is this struggle? How long does it think that this struggle is, how long is it going to take? for us to catch up with these guys, maybe to own like maybe 16% uh, of, of, of the, you know, 16% which will be equivalent to the, to, the, to the population which we occupy on the global stage. Let's so give that, it to that's just my question. Thank you. Yeah, great stuff.
Thank you so much. Yeah, let me uh, uh, start by saying that the, the rate of uh, creating wealth, in other words, creating a billionaire, uh, for a person to come out, even a nation to come out of poverty, a whole nation, because of all the technological advances that have already happened mm -hmm. and the integration of the world economies, it takes 30 years, one generation. So if you are uh, 35 today, by 65, you can be either a multimillionaire or a billionaire, for sure. It takes one generation now. It's well established. Mm -hmm. Singapore has yeah. been yeah. proved all over. China yeah. only started. Yeah to go where it, it is. They right only started in 1979 to do what they Sorry about that, sir. Sorry. Yeah, so they started in 1979. On the issue of finance, for instance, I mean, I've studied finance at university, but I'm not a finance practitioner. But what I know about finance, and I've, I've participated in startups, for instance, mining startups, where there's no cent on the table. And people think that to start a multi-billion dollar business, you yourself must have a few billions or something. Many of the celebrated CEOs, including the one like Neil Freeman, who owns the largest gold mines. I, I was involved, I was a partner in that business at the time. I'm still a shareholder in some parts of those mines. Uh, he had nothing. He went to a localized school in North Cliff and went to Vets. His profile and mine are very different out of the fact that he was white, obviously had more other things than me. But when he was struggling, I mean, he was eating pop and flakes, he had absolutely nothing. And by hiring the office, what he did, he had three CAs in the office, three people who specialize on finance. I said, I confronted him one day and I said, what kind of mining company is this one that has got more CAs than engineers? Uh, uh, and I was unwise, of course, in that query, because what was needed was people who actually know how finance works. And he raised all the capital that he needed. And today is the largest in the form 2003. That's when the first time I met him, 2003. Today, he is the largest miner in South Africa. He's not much older than me. So the problem of finance, let me add this. So you must have people who know finance in your team and in your network. People who know finance, how to raise capital. Number two, there's something that we don't realize. Here in Africa, interest rates are high. Interest rates in Europe are negative, meaning that Europeans are looking for places to send their money to. They don't want to keep their money in Europe. So now, when you meet people who know finance, what they are going to do is to source that capital because it's lying idle in Europe. Bring it here and finance local businesses. So those are some of the issues we still need to get into, the detail of it, of how you go about it. But finance, to me, is not a worry. It's not a worry, not at all. It can be done. Well, building capital is a collaborative effort, gents. I'm getting that. Uh, partnership, operate effort. We need to work together. Find the resources that are around you and check the strength of who you have around you. Cooperatively, you'll be able to get it through. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, any other question? As we get in closer and closer to our time. Hello, my leader. Yes, 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 leadership. Yes. Uh, first and foremost, let me applaud uh, Mr. Sandy Reswan for the brilliant presentation. And I think uh, it has a lot of wisdom in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like the fact that he started the whole thing from, from the Bible. And which is one of my interests because I'm still studying theology. And uh, again, I'm supervisor of studies when it comes to the preachers. So that is one thing that I've, I've just take out from uh, his presentation. And my question is, because he's already answered the one, because I was going to ask a question saying, now that we bought uh, expensive cars uh, to show off, 
and uh, maybe with loans from the banks. And now those cars are gone. They have been repossessed. The house, fancy house that we stayed in, they have been repossessed. Now we have nothing left. Where do we start? So, but the, um, when I listened very carefully, I think he answered it by saying, you need to have uh, people around you uh, where you can start building uh, the business. It's not all about having uh, monetary, but it's also intellectual, when you have intellectual where you can be able to have a business plan and sell uh, the idea so that you can get investments. And the other thing that I've listened to is uh, by fundraising, how you fundraise. So I think he answered that question. So my second question is, now that China uh, is pumping a lot of money and is allowing us to borrow a lot of money from them, uh, for me, I, I just want to ask this, is that not a, a, a bait that they use, uh, using money as a bait to control uh, South Africa. So that now, like uh, the other countries have yet that there are countries now that they control because those countries, they fail to pay them back because they borrowed them a lot of money. And the other in, uh, incident, and he will correct me if I, uh, I'm wrong or the story is wrong. The other thing is, the China, when there was that religious man who wanted to come here in South Africa, the China government said, no, uh, South Africa must not allow that person to come in South Africa because they had some uh, uh, disagreement with that person. And immediately that story ca came. It was now, we were told that that person cannot come into South Africa because of the passport and their visa and all of those stories. But according to my analysis, it was going back to what now the story of China was, uh, 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 was being related. So now I'm, I'm asking whether China is not using money as a bait uh, to control uh, South Africa. Because in Bloemfontein, for instance, uh, now our, our minister uh, said to us, we, we need to learn China, uh, Chinese, one of the Chinese language. And my question was, why China uh, Chinese cannot learn our language since are the ones that are going to come to South Africa. So now I, 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 was, I was like skeptical in terms of what China is doing. So I just want to uh, uh, get maybe a response from uh, Mr. Swana to, to elaborate more on that. Thank you. I, I think that there, there are a few things that are straightforward that we need to do. When I was working for Caltex Oil, one of the things that I had to do was to recruit new dealers, people who are going to own petrol stations. Some of those people, that was before 19, uh, before independence. Uh, now, so I would go to these people's homes and interview them in their homes. It was a compulsory part of the recruitment process. What I then discovered when recruiting Indians, for instance, he was here in Joba, going to Lanasia, what Indians were doing, uh, they've got a township house, Lanasia has been regarded as a township those days, but what they would do, they would build, turn the township house and make it into a 12 bedroom mansion in Lanasia. And then you find that when the children are growing, they contribute capital to create this mansion. They are not rushing to buy houses in Senti and so on. Now, if you look, for instance, my wife is from Fost Loras. They've got a house there. That house is her inheritance. It's already known. It's already, sorry, owned, debt free. Why can't you create a mansion out of that and take your capital and invest it into productive activities and live nicely in your own house until you can have more spare money to buy luxuries. That's the first mistake that our people are making. Lord Yam, Lanasia, even here in Fortsburg, Mayfair, Indians have built beautiful mansions on very cheap land and turned the whole place into a high-priced environment. We don't do that in the black community. Instead, we take millions that we've earned hard borrow money into the bank 
and then buy houses we cannot afford in Renberg and Senti. That is the problem, the starting point. We are not investing using the capital, no matter how small we think it is that we already have. Coming to the issue of China, China is not our problem. So if somebody sees that you are stupid, in other words, you are going to borrow money that you have no income with which to pay the loan. They will give you the loan knowing that after a certain six months period or 18 months, you are going to have no money to pay the loan and repossess the asset, take the asset over. Mm -hmm. It's the same problem that African countries general and leaders, political leaders, have not got wise strategies of, even if you borrow the money, borrow it for an asset that is going to generate more money than the money you are borrowing so that you can easily pay that loan off and not put yourself in danger. Mm. China and the Chinese Communist Party are politicians like any other politician. So you go to Botswana, uh, you go to Namibia, they've built structures there for the government, there are even Confucius centers of learning and this and the other, all sorts of things like that. Because they want to capture your mind, you and your politicians. That is the job of a politician. So you cannot have a Chinese politician doing the job of a Zambian politician or a South African. Our politicians must do their jobs and be equal to the politicians of the other side. America now is asking Kenya for space to put their armies and run their drones there. It's up to the Kenyan politicians whether they've got enough wisdom to match Donald Trump or not. It's not Donald Trump to stop them from being stupid. That is not his job. So. That is another one. The one of the Dalai Lama and the language. Uh, that is another politics that is not linked to, uh, to the loans. But the comrades, ANC especially, is, has led a long alliance with China. So in that alliance now they are causing problems because they should be allowing freedom of movement in South Africa. So that again, that is a matter of politics. And it's unnecessary, it's avoidable. We are still, we are not trapped, we can still make our own decisions. Yeah. We have well to get out of it. Yeah, we can still get out of it. Gents, we have a few minutes left, three minutes. Anybody wants to have a bite? I see there's a comment here from Mr. Sipay. He says, I like the insight on the requirement of, requirement of knowledge and depth in every business opportunity we intend to venture into. Brilliant enlightenment. So, any other question? As we close, gents, ladies. Yeah, let me come, let me come back with the second question, uh, 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 second round. Um, of, uh, yeah, Go so, uh, yeah, Mr. Sendile, uh, this is Kwame Gonza. I wanted to ask, uh, I don't know whether he has spoken about uh, uh, everyone who is starting a business, be it in South Africa, because I think the focus is on South Africa. Uh, to think about not only South Africa, but to integrate that business in, in the African uh, context. I mean, to Good target the, the, the whole 1.3 billion people uh, as a population, as a market. Yes, Kwame. Yes, Kwame. I didn't mention that when we're asking about the, the period it would take to create uh, multimillionaires and multi-billionaires and to create rich nations. The Intra-Africa trade, in other words, the goods that are sold between uh, Zambia and South Africa, Zambia and Kenya, all of the trade between the countries is 17% of the total trade in, in, amongst African countries. In other continents, it's more than 64%, which means that intra-Africa trade is supposed to grow by four times, four times, supposed to grow four times. That idea of producing goods and services for all of Africa is going to produce many multimillionaires and many multi-billionaires uh, right now in the immediate future. So that is another major, major opportunity that we need to study, understand, master, and implement straight away. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Yo mic is off. Bo, your mic is off. Switch on your mic. You are talking, we can't hear you. Wow, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, and it's even getting darker now. I see we have we have got to the end of our time. I will take one last question if there's any, and then we can uh, let our uh, host go. Leadership in closing and in the absence of any question, uh, what can you say in closing? And just for the guys who are having conversations in groups and the ladies who are geared up in talking, just in a nutshell, closing, uh, in summary, what would you say? Um, there, there are two things I want to say. Mm. Uh, whether you call this thing development, whether you call it entrepreneurship, mm. please become a professional. Uh, uh, if you've grown up anywhere in Africa, you know the difference between an amateur soccer player and a professional soccer player. Mm. Become a professional business person. In other words, the literature you read, your learning, your skills, your everything, you must be deep. You must be very deep. It is Africans, not Chinese, not Americans, not Europeans who are going to develop Africa. It is us. And you must be one of those who are going to be touch bearers. The seventh thing that I want to do, and it's a request to all of you to get my uh, WhatsApp details, get my email, send me comments, send me questions, because these lecture notes I'm presenting, this is a manuscript that I want to send to the publishers, but it would be good if it is uh, having realistic insights from the ground, uh, and then I can improve it before submitting it for publication. Thank you so much. Once again, it's a great privilege to work with you fellows. May God bless you immensely, time and time again. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, my leader. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. And uh, yeah, great stuff. Wealth of knowledge. We appreciate you. We'll keep in touch. Thank you, sir. God bless. Ladies and gentlemen, we got to the end of our meeting now. Thank you so much for your... For, this lecture and we hope to see you again in a fortnight for another lecture. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sona. Thank you both. Hello. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Bye -bye. Thank you. We're hoping this is not the last